<laughs> All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Property Pro Tips straight from the pros. Today we have one, Mr. Todd Wheatley. Todd is a managing partner of Candor Realty and Millennium Holding Group, LLC, a real estate firm located in Massachusetts. With nearly 10 years of real estate experience, Todd specializes in fix and flips, short-term rentals, condo conversions, and man managing rental properties in Ohio, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. He and his partners own 500 plus residential apartment units. Todd lives in Hampton, New Hampshire, with his wife, Jessica, and three children. Before real estate, he had 15 years of leadership and project management experience at companies like <laughs> Athena Health, I think that's Athe Athena Health and Wayfair. <laughs> in 2020, in COVID, he transitioned to real estate full time. Welcome to the show, Todd. Glad to have you, man. Yeah, thank you, Trevor. Thanks for having me. Um, and yeah, that that one uh, that company definitely catches people. We've uh, I think we've been called kind of you know Aetna and and confused with many different health companies. So you're not alone. But thank you for thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for thanks for coming on our show and giving us your time, man. We'll we'll, we'll jump right into it. We'll tell, we'll tell, tell us a little bit about just, uh, that was your background. But uh, what's your twenty second elevator speech? Yeah. So, I mean, that, that bio was great, right? Um, you know, graduated college back, you know, 20 years ago or so, went went into IT at the time, which was a, a booming industry, really growing. Um, so made a good living in the in the Boston IT space, but just, you know, grew tired of it as as many of us do in the climbing the uh, corporate ladder, was exposed to real estate investing at a small scale. My wife and I had done some kind of live-in flips and we just really had a passion for real estate. We we uh, we liked improving properties and saw uh, you know a potential living to be made in in that space and so as you mentioned in the open our timing was interesting right so uh, we made that switch away from a nice steady W two income to kind of you know uh, making our own right going the self employment route and we did that kind of during COVID which is a very scary time but um, it's it's been a really really great four and a half years and uh, I, I wouldn't change a thing awesome man took some big courage, much courage to do so in such turbulent times in 2020. Yes. Yeah. In hindsight, it wasn't probably the, the smartest thing, but um, sometimes you just do what you do what you're compelled to do. So do, do what feels right. Yes. <laughs> right. So, so jumping into to our first question, uh, Todd, what inspired your transition out of it 15 years of tech, uh, the uh, doing sound like project management, like we imp implementing, Software systems at the large company it sounds like some usually with IT involves or IT help support. What yes. was, uh, what was the transition like? What made you get bored of that? Yeah, so I mean, it, it it was great, right? I don't I don't have any regrets about the IT space. I was running really really large teams in Boston. We were running data centers, you know, a lot of really interesting work, and the people were fantastic. But after a few fits and starts at some of these companies, right, where, you know, everything's, you know, uh, uh, wonderful, and then you go through kind of some layoffs, and you go through this market cyclicality, you start to realize, like, how control of your own destiny are you, right? Um, you're kind of, you know, you're relying on that income, that paycheck to come in. And obviously, we were making, my wife and I were making some strategic investments to kind of hedge against that. But we, it really became clear to me in my in my 30s that, I wanted more control over my kind of financial destiny and around the companies that we were building. So it wasn't so much that it was it was uh, I lost my passion or love for for IT or that space or the community. It was really just I saw real estate as a very, very proven, clear path to build my own business, surround myself with people that were in you know that were you know worlds ahead of me as far as you know apartments and rentals and things like that. And I saw that the scale and the upside was essentially infinite if you're smart about your growth and smart about the deals that you're doing. And that was really attractive to me. And and, and that's really what, you know, that autonomy, that control, that flexibility in the lifestyle is what ultimately kind of made me, um, you know, decide on making that shift. And, and you know, it, as you can probably attest to and many of your other guests have attest to, you know, when you're self-employed and, and in the real estate business, especially when you're getting started, you know, it's it's you're working more hours than you were when you were at the full time corporate job. Right. So anytime I hear somebody, uh, you know, say, oh, I want to do this because of my work life balance or because I want to like work from the beach. I'm like, well, that might be the end goal. And you might be able to do that in, in some period of time. But like 
you better get ready to build and grind and, and really be in the weeds for some period of time. And, um, but without that, uh, you know, you don't have the same, you know, uh, respect for what it is that you're building. So yeah, it's, it's, it's been, it's been a lot of work and it's been a hard shift, but it's been, it's been very, very rewarding. And how would the, how is it rewarding more? Um, is it, how is it more rewarding aside from the freedom? Not, not the hours. <laughs> how is it yeah. rewarding in the sense of, is it security or? What, what yeah. I, yeah. I mean, so of course the freedom is right. We've, and we've established, I'm sure we'll get into this, you know, we've built teams around us. We've built companies and teams to help us run our properties and our projects. And so that has allowed us, whereas, you know, we were, we were in the weeds with every step of the way when we got started back in 2019 and 2020, we've been able to kind of pull back. Right. So I have three, three young kids, as you mentioned in the open, if I need to be somewhere, I don't have to call a boss. I don't have to ask anybody. It's mm -hmm. I coordinate my schedule with my team and I go where I need to go. Right. And so that autonomy and that flexibility of, of schedule is, you know, unbelievable. Right. If that's important to you beyond that, obviously it's been, it's been financially rewarding, right? We've, We've had some great projects that we can go through. Uh, we've built a lot of equity for ourselves, for our investment partners. And, um, and so there's obviously the financial reward, which is, um, which is, which is great. And, and then just kind of building, this is kind of an underrated thing, but it's been very important to me and, and my business partners. We've built multiple companies in the real estate space that provide for others, right? And so our employees, our teams can make a living, a, a really good living, um, helping to expand our vision of building these large real estate, real estate portfolios. And so that is a very rewarding experience to build a company that not only, you know, puts a lot of money in the bank or provides personal flexibility, but that actually allows people to go out there, do a really good job, work hard on building something and advancing their own careers. And so that's, you know, I, I would say that's been, that's been great as well. It's a very interesting point you bring up there. And it, um, Todd, that you don't hear it enough. It is underrated. I would agree. And I just want to restate it for the purposes of for the audiences. When you're building companies, you're actually not only helping yourself, you're providing jobs. Yeah. You're creating income for a whole crew of people. The bigger your company gets, the more families you can affect in a positive way because you're giving right. some kind of stable income. Right. And I think yep. that's lost on a lot of entrepreneurs, at least at first. It's, a, it's very self-centered, but when you after you've been in it for a while and take pull the camera back, you realize how many lives, not only tenants that you can affect and make better, but your employees as well and your family. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And so what when you first started out going from IT to real estate, which is a about as different as it can be, maybe healthcare. Mine would be a little, really far over to that one eighty over. And what what was some of the, the biggest challenges you faced faced at the beginning? Well, I think you just hit the nail on the head, right? It was, um, there was a learning curve. Now, you know, for me, it wasn't cold turkey, right? So um, as I had alluded to, my wife and I had some small projects, some live-in flips. Okay. We had bought some single family rental properties in Ohio. My business was taking me down to Ohio. My corporate job was taking me to Ohio. So we had an opportunity to kind of put one foot in the door for about a year and a half before I made the switch. And so I really had a chance to understand you know, if I was going to enjoy this or not. Furthermore, we were, we had decided to house hack. Um, so very common up here, I'm sure it is there. So we bought a multifamily house. Uh, we lived in one unit and then rented out the other units. And that allowed us to lower our living expenses to a point where very, very comfortably I could leave, I could leave corporate, not have all of this financial pressure on us. You know, it wasn't the forever goal, but it was a it was a it was a temporary shift that allowed us to just really bring down those living expenses. Know that we had a roof over our head. Know that we had some passive income coming in, so that I could make that shift into full time real estate investing because it's a new world, new connections, new network, new relationships, and so you have to rebuild. You know a lot of that, and that takes time, and so. Again, it wasn't kind of a cold turkey switch. It was a year of preparation and then kind of a year after the shift of of really getting my legs under me um, in the investment space, which which again, in hindsight, and I, I we we share this with a lot of folks that come into our network, 
really have a plan. You know, if you want to leave your W-2, don't do that on a whim. Plan it out. Make sure you've got some money in the bank. Make sure you know where you got your 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 passive your income is going to come from because it could be a year or two before you ha really have any sizable income coming in from your from your new efforts. It's the long game, right? It is the long. Absolutely, it's the long game. We have to remind ourselves of that every day. All the time. <laughs> yep. Oh, it's not so long to where I expire before it actually wins the game. <laughs> There's a balance, right? You don't want to be too long, but you have to, yes, you do have to understand that everything you're doing now, everything we're doing now to build, build the team, build the property, add value. This is not, this is not an industry where you, you know, where that, you know, that reward comes tomorrow. That reward might come in 10 years. And you just have to realize that, you know, if you're working on the right things, if you're building the right team around you and focused on the right projects, you're planting seeds that will bear fruit, you know, you know, years down the road. At least we know our children will be okay, right? <laughs> yes. Yes, we know a lot of second generation real estate, you know, folks that have in inherited a lot of portfolios. Um, and yes, that that statement you just said is couldn't be further from the truth. Hey, if that's if that's all we can do, that's what it ends up with. From my personal point of view, if my daughter's in a better off than I started with, then it was a successful life, right? Yeah, no question. <laughs> what, what was, so you talked about house hacking a bit. Um, I have learned this from interviewing my Massachusetts connections now. <laughs> it, we we use it on the West Coast and talk about it, but we don't use it to the extent that in our vocabulary as um, I've heard from um, I think three or four folks from Massachusetts that, that uh, have used it in every in an interview. Talk a little bit about that, if you, if you don't mind. Tell us, tell us how does that, how, how, what's house hacking to you and on your side of the uh, world? Yeah, to, to, to me, it is a very, very often used term here, right? It is not a new concept by any mm -hmm. means. Um, and, and from what I understand, it's actually used in different contexts, depending on where in the country you are. Now in New England, specifically Boston and some of the Massachusetts cities we work in, there's a lot of older multifamily buildings. And obviously the cost of living is very high. And so for us, the most common term that we use house hacking for is multifamily, small multifamily, two to four unit building. You, you know, buy a building, you use an FHA loan or low down payment conventional loan. You occupy typically the smallest unit that you and anyone around you, if you're married or you're, you know, have a partner or a family, you occupy the smallest space in the property that you're able to live in. So in order to maximize the rental income and rental potential, from the rest of the property. With that being said, we know plenty of people that do the same thing with single family houses. So they say, I don't want to own a multifamily. I want to go buy a four bedroom single family house and I'm going to rent the other three rooms out to my friends or to strangers or what have you. Wow. As far as we're concerned, that is also house hacking, right? <laughs> you are creatively thinking about the place that you're living, not only as a, as a home, right? but as an investment vehicle that can propel and accelerate that financial freedom, right? And so we do use the term a lot. It's primarily multifamily, but it can be applied to really any type of property, as long as you just put an investment flair on it and really think about how that, how that property can become an, a, a, an asset rather than just a liability. I see, I see, I see. It's a little bit different on house hacking on the West Coast, how do you guys? How do you guys refer to it? It's uh because property prices are so ridiculous in Southern California. Um, the house hacking for in my my personal experience is I bought a fixer upper in Redondo Beach. The dirt's worth more than the structure, and yeah. the appreciation goes up very very quickly as you it's got because the sky's the limit because the city has the word beach in it. Any city right. with the word beach in it, <laughs> the, the appreciation can, can be sky. You can force the appreciation on just like you would a multifamily. Usually single yep. family homes, that's just kind of market driven on demand and emotion. But house hacking in this case would be fixing up a well-located single family home, living in it, waiting out the year or two, couple of years, and then getting a sizable HELOC and using the HELOC to buy apartment buildings. That's the house. Hacking. Oh, interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, a little different, right? <laughs> it is. It's, it's, it's another fantastic tactic. Um, but yeah, def it's interesting that the same terminology can be used in different contexts in, in, uh, in different parts of the country. Oh yeah. That's, a, that's why I like, 
All right, this is the third time I've heard that. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I'm going to ask this time. I, need, I, I think it might be a little bit different than what we think over here. That's what yeah. thank you, thank you but, for but what's interesting is, right, the commonality is that we're all solving, we're all trying to solve, a, you know, a cost of living. We're trying to, mm -hmm. we're all trying as investors to minimize the contribution or the living expense that we personally have, right? And whether you're doing that, you know, via the model that you just described or whether you're doing it through the, the model that we describe, it's, you're it's you're propelling your investment journey by using your primary residence. So uh, right. that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for explaining that. The way you, the way you explain that too, that's interesting. Like, instead of rent out the rooms, I think my wife would shoot shoot me if I tried to rent out our <laughs> our back rooms. <laughs> but yep. uh, if you if you're in that place in life, that's a that is a great strategy, especially with the Airbnbs kind of things that go on. You can rent out rooms, or we could put even bunk beds in, in a room and rent out a bed. Imagine. Sky's the limit. It's, and like you said, right, it's about where, where you are in, in, in your, in your life journey, um, mm -hmm. who, you know, what responsibilities and, and, uh, you know, you have to other people or partners or kids, things like that. Um, but the point is, and as I'm sure you've heard this Trevor from your guests, and we certainly hear it from our network, it's like, there is no, you know, folks like to put real estate investing in a box and it's like, there isn't a, it's not a box. It's like, I, I had a, I had a meetup last night and we had our guest speaker who was focused on co-living, which is room rentals and room rental arbitrage. And I mean, I've been in this game full time for five years now. And, and she was teaching me stuff that, that I didn't know in my own market. And yeah. it, it's just, there is no that, one man. size. What, what, what yeah. Is co-living is that another type of house hack that you would call? Co-living is essentially leased by the room, oh, right? Yeah. And right. so, and, and so, it's it's kind of a euphemism, but it's a it's a very well, you know, I, I had heard the term before, but I didn't really dive deep into it. And it's um, there's a lot of it going on in Boston again, conversion of smaller units into larger units with more bedrooms and more bathrooms, and then you, we have a lot of student population in Boston, yes. and so that can be a very compelling kind of clientele. That folks that come here for school, they need to, they need a year to get you know, their feet under them. They're focused on their studies. They're focused on their job. They need a room, a bathroom, and a safe place to live. And they're paying a thousand, twelve hundred, fifteen hundred dollars for a room in many cases in Boston. And so, as an investor, you're able to kind of maximize your top line revenue and therefore uh, improve the efficiency of the property. So, again, I'm not a subject matter expert on it, so I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole. But the point is, is like. If you're listening to this and you're thinking that you can't get, you know, you don't want to do long-term rentals or you don't want to do short-term rentals. There's so many different ways to real estate invest. Find the niche that that attracts you the most that you feel like you would be most successful in and double down on it. Right. And just stay really focused and consistent on it. hundred percent, hundred percent. I would just add to that advice for listeners, find somebody who's doing it and get a mentor. Yes, that's, it's, there's a lot of mistakes to be made out there, and if you can find the guy who's made them already and learn from them, <laughs> skip skip them if you can. Yeah, if somebody wants yeah. to give you the cheat code, you take the cheat code. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly that's exactly it. I've learned. I only had to learn that lesson once, and I got a, five mentors after that. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, what was your most significant deal, Todd? What so so far? I would say, I mean, we've had some really good ones. I would say the one that, you know, we look back on most fondly was um, mostly because we, we aren't sure if we were lucky, crazy, or or really good. Um, we bought, now when I say we, right? So the Canada Realty team is really three general partners. Um, there was four partners on this particular deal I'm about to talk about. But we, um, we found, so again, our office, our home office was in Lowell, Massachusetts. And there was this 40 year old, you know, 40, yeah, 40 ish year old, 132 unit apartment building, about a mile from our office. And again, you got to remember, we were coming from two unit, three unit, four unit. We had bought some portfolios, 50, 75 units total. So this was by far the biggest single property that we had looked at. And it had been on and off the market for some time, professionally brokered. And the owner, who happened to also be the individual that built it, was very emotionally attached to this building. And so every time a buyer would come in, he would kind of find a reason to blow the deal up or not kind of uphold his end of the bargain. And yeah, and so we came in a little bit naive, a little bit cocky, right? And 
just wouldn't take no for an answer. We befriended him. We worked really hard. We overcame every kind of objection that he had. And so anyway, make a very long story short, we bought this 132 unit building. It was tired, right? It, the units needed to be updated. The rents were low, but man, was it in a good area, transit oriented area on a, in a very, very nice um, part of Lowell and, and Chelmsford, Mass. And so anyway, it took a year from the time we had the first uh, you know, offer signs to closing was just about a year. And we closed on it um, for 20 million, just about $20 million. We had a credit, so it was a little under 20 million. Um, and we, we just worked hard. We had a professional property manager. We were there all the time. We renovated units, we improved the rents. And we started getting phone calls from really large Boston you know, buyer groups. And they were saying, how the heck did you guys buy that thing? We tried to buy that two years ago. And so they were very impressed that we were able to kind of see that through. And we were like, why are these guys calling us already? Like, <laughs> and so we actually ended up getting an offer about six months after we closed on it. And we couldn't sell it because of short-term capital gains tax. So we were like, call us back in like, at, call us back at 12, uh, 12 months in a day, right? And they did. Yeah, yeah. So we ended up selling it 13 months after we bought it for a $6 million profit. Wow. Yeah. And wow. so our that investors, we had, that, we had, that, we had, amazing. yeah, we had investors on that deal. We were, we were the general partners on the deal. And that really put the nail down for us and said, this is what we want to do. There is a lot of value to create here. And there's a lot of money to be made for both us and for our investment partners. So that was kind of the, that was the jumping off point. And it's been, um, it's been grow, grow, grow ever since. So let's talk a little bit more about that topic. How did you get, so did you, were the vacants unit or were the units vacant and did, or did you move people in and tenants in and out and re renovate or how, how, how'd you go about the process and where did you get the funding for the construction? Yeah, that's a great question, right? So we, we again, we got um, one of our partners comes from a financial background and insurance underwriting background. So he's got a lot of experience kind of underwriting these deals. And so we went into it and we knew, we knew that these units were tired. So we assigned, you know, cost to unit terms. We assigned value to improving the common areas, to doing a roof, to, to all of these, you know, major things that we knew would increase the value of the property. And so we also, what we, one thing we did, which is a shift, we, we've since built a property management company, but to your point earlier, we called the best property manager that we could find. And we're like, we want you guys to run this for us because we were coming from a, a, an owner who was writing rent rolls out on sheets of paper and who inventoried the office on a napkin. And we were like, no way, we need technology, we need electronics, we need you know, electronic payment systems for our tenants, and we don't know what we're doing. So we hired a property manager, and I swear to God, Trevor, that company made us more money by adding the technology and the process and the consistency and we didn't and we didn't know that going into it, but in hindsight, we were like that order and that process is what made this building attractive to the next buyer, right? Sounds the like financial awesome burn order. Company. So good to hear, like when you find a good property management company, because we're always like the the footstool of the real estate industry here, and we're always trying our company, Beachfront Property Management. We're trying to dispel that in, in doing good, just like you are like to actually be good at what we're doing, not just collect checks and post notices. Yeah. Yeah. Good pro as you know, right. You guys are, are, have a significant, you know, property management company. It's, it's, if, if you're doing your job, well, you are actually making your clients properties worth more money and, and paying for yourself. Right. Yeah. And paying for your services. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You pay, pay your percentage. And I, I advise my friends and business partners, like, you get what you pay for with property management. I mean, that's in life in general, but especially in property management because it's so low margin that pay that extra percent if you heard, if you've got their references that prove that they're good and they yeah. know the value add play and if they work with syndicators or if they're just a mom and pop stabilized kind of shop. Yeah. Like do, your, do your homework. Exactly. Sounds like, sounds like you did. That's awesome. We did. We did. And we're glad we did. And so, but you now have brought your property management in house. Yeah, we brought it in house. Um, you know, we've we've sent. That's one of the divisions that we've launched. And again, we like we you know with our 
projects. We learned a lot from those guys. We're still very friendly with those guys, but we have right. since launched our own property management division in-house. That's right. And I've seen that happen somewhere about the 400 or 500 unit mark. Is that, is that about when you brought it in-house? We started thinking about it at the 100 unit mark. Oh, uh, it, yeah. And so, so this was kind of sup, supplemental to, at the same time we had that 132 unit property, we had some other projects going as well that totaled about 100 units by themselves. And so in parallel, we were kind of launching the property management company okay. but with a large commercial asset like that building that I just walked you through. We really wanted to have a large commercial property manager on that building. Once we sold that building is kind of when we sat down and said, we're, we want to we want to scale our internal operations kind of up. And that's what we did. Awesome. Yeah. And that's, I've encouraged buyers or investors and such, hey, get, get a property management company. Even if you know you're going to sell it, tell them like, hey, the, I'm fixing flipping this thing in 18 months. Yep. Can you help me? And if it's a good property management company, then yes, we'll just change our strategy. We charge a little bit more for that, but we'll help you on the onboard and the offboard of it. And it, here's what that contract looks like. We're happy to yep, do so. Absolutely. And it's and it's it's all about being upfront and transparent and and think of, thinking as we, you know, whether it's a property management company, a lender, these are partners, right? Don't abuse that relationship, right? They're partners. Many times property managers, we've been we've had property management companies bring us deals. We've had property managers help us sell deals, right? Uh, both on and off market. And so, you know, who are property managers talking to every single day, right? You know, owners, investors, buy, investors <laughs> right? buyers and sellers, right? And so it, it's it's um, it's a relationship that you should really, you know, lean heavily on and um, and just, you know, just be transparent with these folks because the, like you said, it's more than just collecting checks. It's more than just answering maintenance calls. It's um, they can be really, really accretive to your uh, to your business. In, here in California, you can make or break a project due to the regulatory regulate, yeah, all the regulations right. for California. Then, like local and city level, regional LA County's got its laws. LA City's got its laws. It's like then like different neighborhoods will have their law, like different yeah. idiosyncrasies. So it's a, we become we're half lawyer over here in California. <laughs> so yeah, it like it's a it, it is a value add. If you have a strong property management company, and you said, like you said, it is a partnership because it, if it's not, then it's just transactional. It's a vendor, and what's the point? Unless that's just all you need, and you're actually going to be, you just stabilize, and you're just trying to collect checks, mailbox money, and you're not too active. Exactly. So, which is cool with some people. Exactly. Different strokes for different folks. So the oh, what, now that not too much time has passed. It's been four, four years, right? And it seems like it's been a while. 2020 seems like it was- Feels feels a heck of a lot longer than four years. Like, doesn't, doesn't COVID seem like a lifetime ago? Ancient it's history. Four, right, it's crazy. So you've moved the needle big time in four years. And what does your portfolio look like now? And what are you, what are you focusing on? Yeah, so so right now, and, and really, you know, twenty late 2022 and early 2023 were a period of rapid growth for us, right? We added, we, we grew the portfolio up to about 500 units, um, our property management division about 700. So 500 of which we either, we own and operate um, as, as either we own them outright or we're the general partners on syndication deals. And then 200 for kind of third party clients, okay. because we also have a brokerage division, right? That's how we got our start. We were hmm. buying and selling small properties ourselves and we were helping friends and family and clients buy by itself. So the brokerage is really a, is still really a really important uh, division for us. And that also is we have a lot of clients that buy a three family or a five family and they're like, I still have a full-time job. So I want to buy it because I want to own the property myself, but I'm going to let you guys manage it. And so that's kind of, that's how we got up to about 700 units. Um, the last 12 months or so, and I presume you guys are seeing this out West too, but Deal flow for large commercial assets, so apartment buildings, large portfolios, have really slowed down. Right, rates. The commercial real estate market is heavily impacted by you know um, lending rates and mortgage rates, and so a lot of the deals we're seeing have been on the market for a while. They've been shopped around for a couple of years. The sellers are looking for a premium price, and so we've had to shift our focus a little bit, um, it, you know, just to keep that forward momentum. But uh, that, the large apartment building space, we're, we're excited for that to come back because that's really what we want to be buying more of. But um, yeah, just not seeing a lot of really good. We're, 
we are value add discount buyers. So if I want to go buy a turnkey property for an absurd cap rate and not make much money, um, those I can find, but that's not what we do. And so we've kind of, you know, we're always looking, we're always shopping. Our team is always looking, but there's just not a lot of really rich deals um, in that space right now. So we've, like I said, we've pivoted our strategy a little bit. And what does that pivot look like? What is it, what is it you're focusing into or what you pivot into? Yeah. So ironically, what we're doing, and this is actually what we are, one of our very first projects was similar to this, where we bought a portfolio of small properties, single families, condos, small multifamilies. We bought it as a package. So we bought it as a commercial asset and then we ripped it apart and we sold them one at a time. And so we, we bought a commercial set of real estate properties and we sold them as residential properties. Because when you sell a single family house or a two to four unit multifamily or a condo, that's a residential sale. And so if you can buy that package right at a good price and you understand the arbitrage there on what the value is as a as a in, as individual properties, you can make a lot of money. And so we've been very successful at finding some amount of distress in folks that are retiring, estates, inheritance, folks that don't want to continue to own and operate these properties that are willing to sell them at a price that either you know, just they're willing to take a discount on the price because it's a one buyer. They're like, I don't want to sell 30 properties individually. That sounds terrible. And we're like, that sounds great. Right. So we have a team that can do that. We have a property management division or brokerage. We have all the, all the parts in place to rip that portfolio apart and sell stuff individually. So that's what we've been doing. We've been doing a lot of small package arbitrage because the the residential market up here in New England is still very very strong. So if I can if I can find you know a set of four three families in a great area that might have tenant issues that might need some updates, we'll buy those four properties at a discount. We'll address the issues via our teams that we've built and then we'll we'll sell them individually into the residential market which is super strong right now. So we're seeing really, really, uh, really good strength in that rental, in that residential market. And so we're able to arbitrage a difficult commercial package into a strong residential market. And so we've been, that's, we've been doing that for about 12 months now. And um, that is going very well. That is a unique and very creative. I, I don't believe I've heard that exact strategy before. And are these coming from banks? Are they, are are they, Reaps are they single sellers? Broke are they listed? At all the all the above. We've had lenders call us. We've had property management co- companies call us. We've had agents put us in touch with you know bring us deals. We've met sellers or or representatives of estates. So if if you know the owner has passed away and it goes to the estate and now now the next generation's inheriting it or an estate has inherited it. But they don't that that estate just wants to liquidate the assets. Uh, we're going through a prop a deal right now. I can't. We're not closed yet, so I can't speak in detail. But we're doing the same thing. It's an estate. They just want to liquid liqu- liquidate the assets so they can disperse the funds to the to the um, the heirs, mm-hmm. right? But they don't want to disperse the real estate. They want to disperse cash. And so we come in. We make an offer. We understand that the value. Um, of the of those assets is considerably higher than the purchase price. Um, so it's a win-win because they're looking for a quick and easy sale. We give it to them. Uh, they're they're looking for the money in the bank and we're looking for opportunity to arbitrage and force equity in order to uh, in, to make ourselves and, and our investors money. We, we were talking about creative financing and how deals are getting done right before before we started the show earlier. And that, that is Absolutely creative. Now, was this your idea, Todd? Was this something someone told you about, or did, how did how did that idea come around? About no, I mean it's funny that you ask because I don't reflect on that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's been great. Um, it, you know, one, my partner John, um, I think he had somebody bring him a deal like two years ago, two or three years ago, and it was we looked at it, and we we're like, ah, oh, we don't really buy commercial packages, and then. We were doing a lot of residential work and we were like, well, what are these things? We just like sat in the office and we just, fit, you know, underwrote it. And we we're like, well, what are these things worth? Like, what's our basis if we buy this as a commercial? Pro- like, let's assign a value uh, um, based on the asking price. And we we're like, let's 
based like what's the sale price based on sales comps of a three family or a single family or whatever it was. And we're like, holy crap, like that number is way bigger than that number. And so like we quickly realized that there was this arbitrary, you know, we didn't, I don't think we went into it knowing that, but we quickly realized that, you know, by buying something on a commercial basis and at a, in a, in a convenience for that seller, there was, they were, they were intentionally kind of, well, not always intentionally, but there was, they were leaving a lot of equity on the table and that there was a higher and better way to sell the properties. And so once we realized that we, we went out and actively, you know, are looking for those projects. So, that, so you got the word out to the brokers community. Hey, we're looking for these types of things. Yeah. If you find something weird like this, call us, we'll buy it with buyers. And- exactly. And where a lot of buyers are looking for, um, you know, they're looking at these advertised packages as rental properties. They're saying, well, that doesn't really perform. You know, uh, I'll give you a quick example. So a deal that we recently did, you know, you look at it as a rental portfolio and you're like, this thing doesn't make a lot of cash. But when you look at it as a comparable residential sale and you're thinking about, if I just sell these over the next 12 months, you know, we're doing, a, you know, we, we're in the process of executing on a project that has more than a million dollars of as is equity just between how it's been sold and how we'll sell them as individual properties. No changes, no changes, just, just you know, light updates, a little bit of flooring, light paint, but like the buildings themselves individually, when you add them all up, are worth more, uh, more than a million dollars higher than what the purchase price is as a package deal. So the individual parts are worth more than the sum of the whole. <laughs> That's right. Just don't tell anybody the secret, oh, no, Trevor. No, don't gonna... tell anyone the secret. <laughs> As we broadcast. <laughs> right. That, that, that is so interesting. I want to give a, make a few phone calls after this podcast because I don't see those types of deals come across my desk like where they're bulk pack sometimes and they're, but then they're massive right they're massive deals like a few yeah. hundred and it's institutional level kind of stuff yeah. here in california but i wonder if I don't know how, how those go that's a food for thought and for all those listening like if you're looking for creative ways to buy stuff in this market there's the way that's yeah the best time to buy real estate was yesterday second best time today <laughs> amen to that yeah, so it always is no no matter what real estate will go up yeah <laughs> Yeah. So what were some of your biggest challenges you faced when you first got that step off the cliff? Yeah. <laughs> like you're like, I'm quitting and here we go. I know you kind of put your toe in the water, but there had to be a time where you're like, all right, today's the day. What was that like? And what was like, was there a feeling associated with it? Or were you just ready to go? And you're like, Yeah, it was credibility, right? So like, you know, you're, you're, shifting one industry, you're going into the next and you know, you might've had credibility in the last industry, but nobody really knows you in the new industry. And so like, you know, I would call brokers, Hey, yeah, we're, we're actively looking to buy this. And they were like, who is this? Like, who are you? And, 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 and what you realize is like, they want, they have a list of clients and repeat buyers. And so in order to, you know, by the time you're getting the phone call, it's, they've already told 10 people, right? 10 other, 10 other folks have been, have kind of gotten a look at it. And so we really spent a lot of time. We realized this early on, we spent, we had to spend a lot of time on our network. And so, and, and we'll kind of, we'll go into uh, a little bit about what specifically we do to, to kind of expand the network, but we realized that our network was our net worth, right? And that by networking and putting ourselves out there, we were creating new relationships. We were telling people what we were looking for and what we were doing. And that in turn gave us credibility that increased our deal flow and it created in incredible partnerships between investors, vendors, lead sources, and agents. It just, it was really, really valuable to us. And so yeah, yeah, you mentioned it, but how did you get in? So you're coming in cold from IT. Uh, what were the steps you would take? So if someone was to tra- transition and you transitioned in the midpoint of your, of your, of your life, which is yeah. uh, with, with kids and wife, which is, yes. again, your courage level is like up here, right? That's <laughs> That, that transitions. Courage, courage is one word. Your kids. <laughs> courage is one word. Experience. Right. That, yep. <laughs> I mean, that's good. I mean, that's just brave and your wife have to be on board. So I mean, good on you on it. So what, then what you had to go network and what, what were the steps you took and what kind of places or is there any like um, specific uh, groups, sources, sites? Yeah. Sites? So, 
Yeah, absolutely. And 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 I'd be remiss if I didn't give Jessica a shout out because you are right. She was a saint. She was supportive of this of this shift. She she saw the opportunity that, you know, when I laid it out, she it wasn't, you know, you're crazy. It was like, no, this could be really important to us as a family over over time. And we were willing together to make short term sacrifices for the long term gain. So um, I literally couldn't have done it without her. You know, I could have done it earlier when I was single. But if you have a if you have a partner um, or a family having this, having their support, um, and, and, and making sure you're all kind of focused on, you know, why you're doing something that might be painful in the short term and what the, what the, uh, what the kind of long-term benefit is, is so, so important. So, you know, I, I, you mentioned it, I just wanted to kind of make sure we touched upon that quickly. Um, meetups, right. So, so John, when I met John, he was running a, he had just left travelers insurance. He started, you know, he was, active on bigger pockets and he wanted to get like-minded folks around him. Um, so he was hosting a monthly meetup in the apartment building that he was living in, had kind of an event space. And so he think he hosted the very first meetup and like four people showed up. And then the next month, six people showed up. And then the next month, 10 people showed up fast forward to today, right? Five years. And um, we now have eight meetups that we host every single month, mass, New Hampshire, Maine, and each meetup gets anywhere from 20 to 50 people, sometimes up to 75 people. And so what that does is that puts our, it, it, it's it's doing all the things we talked about, right? It's getting ourselves out there. It's allowing the people that are want to get, that are behind us to come into a space that's free, that's comfortable, that's informal. They can come in, hear from guest speakers, meet investors of all calibers, meet industry professionals. And for me, it was thinking back, it was one of the most important things that I personally did. And so now it's a way for us to give back to the folks that are just getting started themselves to come to these free meetups and come and hang out with folks and just kind of talk about what they want to do and why they're doing it and what they need to advance their journey. Um, it, it's by far, it's the best thing that I think we do today. And I think it's the best thing somebody getting started can do as well. And one more question about, <clears throat> excuse me. The meetups, is it, how do you advertise? How do you get the word out? I mean, is it literally meetup.com or is it? We, yep. We do publish them on meetup.com. We put them on bigger pockets. We, uh, now we have a big internal network, right? So we broadcast it out to, you know, we have several thousand folks on our mailing list. And so, but again, that's, not, I don't want this to sound like that's how you start. Mm -hmm. Just go to one, just show up at one. Right. Like there's no barrier, right? Just, no. just find one in your area, go to meetup.com, find one in your area and just show up at it. Right. We have just evolved to a point where we do use those platforms. We use our social media platforms. And then over time, we've built up a list of clients, investors, you know, folks on our mailing list. And so now we, we're able to kind of keep that flywheel and that momentum going because we have that, that network, so to speak. And just to be clear, these are in-person, not Zoom calls. We do. So seven of the eight are in-person. And then we also host a virtual one. And we do that. Because then there's no excuse not to go to one. So <laughs> right. I have to go to one. Uh, but no, no, no. So we we had shifted, you know, virtual during COVID and people loved it. Like we were, we were worried. We're like, man, these are so fun in person. Now we have to shift it to virtual and COVID. And people were showing up and we just all have our little cocktails. And we were just on Zooms when we couldn't be in person and talking real estate. And we're like, man, this is kind of cool and it's approachable and it's easy to do from work or after work. Right. And so we, we kept one, you know, as we shifted back to in-person, we did, we did keep one and it, it continues to get, you know, 20, 25 people. And um, not everybody can show up at 630 at night, right? Some people work, work second shift or, or have a family and can't be there, but they can, they can dial in and so it gives people an option to, uh, to be able to, to, to spend some time with other investors. That, that, that is so cool. And the fact that you have so many, seven of them that you guys actually facilitate yourself is, is there much time, like, is it time intensive for you? They're very time intensive, right? Um, but, but again, we have a team, right? So, you know, I, I coordinate some with my team and John coordinates some with his team and we have great team leads on the brokerage side and it, it's a, it's, it's, they run their own, right? Um, so and so each team is each geography is kind of tasked with you have to have a meetup for investors in your area. You get to pick the venue you get to, but then we have a centralized team that helps with getting the message out with the marketing materials and, 
kind of some of the administrative layers. So it's, um, you know, it's a divide and conquer kind of, it's a team effort for sure. Got it, got it. And in that same type of vein with the meetups, uh, with coming from IT and, and a good background in it, has that had any influence on how you approach real estate? Well, I'm, I was coming from, uh, so IT, but also, you know, an operations background and a corporate leadership background. And so I think the biggest takeaway, less about the technology, right? Because we were doing some pretty advanced stuff in the in the, in the the IT space, which may or may not be applicable to, you know, the real estate world, where, you know, I've really tried to apply things that I've learned is kind of through operations, right? In order to scale a company, it's really about repeatable, consistent operations, clear roles for, fee- for folks on the team. And so that's, it's, and I, again, I think it's less IT specific, but it's just kind of corporate leadership background and applying that to our team, making sure everybody has a clear role, they're in a seat that makes sense for them, um, and that we're not just kind of playing whack-a-mole, that we are focused on consistent, repeatable processes, both internally for our team and externally for our customers, which are our tenants. And that's- and there's probably a bit of project management in there too. And, oh, yeah. and that's gold when it comes to timelines because every day is money lost at, at units vacant. So if you've, if there's project management in IT, you can project manage anything in my, in my opinion. So yes, you, you are. Whether, yeah. Whether it's construction or property management with unit turns or leasing, it's, you are very much right. It's, it's, everything is kind of a small project and, tracking your success of from start to finish um, and how those things interrelate to one another is, is really important. Awesome. Last question before we get to the lightning round. What, what advice would you give someone starting now considering, considering a career change and restarting out? Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, the two things I get asked that question a lot, and the two things that come to mind that we've already touched upon, but I want to summarize because they're really important. So, one, Absolutely. keep the W two as long as you possibly can. Right, you're bankable. You can get mortgages, buy as many multifamilies as you can with that W two before you make the shift. A lot of people don't realize when you give up that W two, you go self employment. You need two years of tax returns. And those tax returns need to show good income in order for you to get a loan. So keep the W-2. I know everybody wants to rush out of the W-2 and, and oh my God, it's so sexy to be self-employed. It's like pump the brakes, keep the W-2 and use that W-2 income to buy as many properties as you can and really develop that that um, that passive income that shows on, on tax returns. So when you make the switch, you're in a, you're in a much better position. And that's number one. Number two is go to meetups. Again, we just touched upon it, but get yourself out there. If you're not out there speaking with other people that are doing what you're doing or doing what you want to be doing, you are behind the eight ball, right? You and I talked on the call before we got started and we mentioned it here, having a mentor and talking to folks that are out in front of you, right? And this is for everybody. Like there's people that are way out in front of us right now. We're talking to them, but then we're also turning around and people are getting started and we're trying to help them as well. And the real estate space is this community. I had a meetup last week in third on uh, in New Hampshire, and one of my good friends came for the very first time, and he goes, "Holy, holy smokes! You guys are so help like you all want to help each other." He's like, "I thought you guys would all be defensive because you're all fighting for the same properties." And I'm like, "There is that mindset, like in anything else, but those guys don't come. To, those folks don't come to the meetups." Right. The folks that come to the meetups are the folks that want to help other people win and that have an abundance mentality. So get yourself to a meetup, tell people what it is that you're trying to do, and it will open doors that you didn't even know existed. Sage, sage, sage advice. Uh, that yeah, it's, the, it's, it's simple. It's simple, it's simple but it, it W-2s works. W2s and meetups. That's it. Yeah. W2, and as long as you can, many meetups as you can get to. Yeah. And, I, and when I first started out with those things, it was going. To, I went to meetups too. I would, used to go to a BNI, Business Networking International, right? <laughs> that was one of the meetup groups I went to, and it yep. was walking in the door and just saying, "Hey, I don't know a thing. <laughs> I want to learn." Yep. And there's power in that, and just being open and honest. And people, 
I, most of my my investor friends are like, how would you just walk in and know her and just say, I'm like, just go in there and tell them what's up. Like, exactly. They're there. The meetup group exists because people want to help and they've been there. Yes. Just like our podcast here is so that others can learn. Like, I wish I would have come across a podcast like this 10 years ago. <laughs> That's our, yes. Like, not mistake, not made some of the mistakes I did. Yeah. Um, so, that, so, you know, showing up, you know, is, is, you're doing more than 90% of people to show up and be consistent and repeatable. And you are, you are off to a great start. Exactly. Show up, pick up the phone, go to the internet, go to the meetup, <laughs> just show up as the hardest thing. Exactly. All right. That brings us to our last little bit here, Todd. All right. Like, well, he's we called a lightning round. I just gonna fire off some questions. Some of them about real estate. Some of them are kind of random. Okay. Let's roll. <laughs> I'm going to ask you and be quiet. You say as much or as little as you like, and we will call it a day, sir. All right. Sounds good. All right. Question one. Are you ready? Yes. Good to go. <laughs> What's one lesson you've learned that you wish you knew before you started investing in real estate? So... We touched upon a couple already, so I won't rehash those. I would say shiny object syndrome, right? So I, I didn't realize how easy it is to become distracted in real estate. It's like, you know, you meet somebody that's into self-storage, you meet somebody that's into RV parks, you meet somebody that's into short-term rentals, Airbnb arbitrage. You're like, whoa, there's like all these ways to make money in real estate. Learn about them. You want to be aware of all the possibilities, but I, I can't stress this enough. Pick a niche that resonates with you. Could be flipping single family houses, could be buy and hold multifamily properties. So like it almost doesn't matter, but you want to enjoy it and you want to become a sub subject matter in it, right? That you there's always a time when you feel like you've mastered a niche that you want to add another one on. But be intentional and be strategic about it and avoid shiny object syndrome. Love it. What is one daily habit that you believe contributes to your success? Oh boy, uh, we could do a whole podcast on that, but um, just one, the one. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> be intentional, right? It, it, shoot, work on things that are most important, right? And so, what I do every day is I write down a list. I actually do it on a weekly basis. I say, okay, here's kind of my boulders, the big ticket things I want to move. Uh, sure, I could get buried in my email or I could make random phone calls throughout the day, but I'm really thinking about what are, what's the two or three things that doesn't sound like a lot, but two or three things that I can do today or this week to advance my biggest goal, right? And so just being really intentional around what those tasks are is um, is very valuable to me because otherwise it's very easy to get buried in the noise. You know, every phone call that comes in, every email that comes in and you feel busy, you feel like you're doing a lot. And then a week later, you look back and go, holy crap, I didn't actually advance the ball on the thing that I need to advance the ball on most. So know, know your why and know the, the, the couple of things that you need to do today or this week to get closer to that goal. Be intentional and know your why. Yep. What's one city you haven't invested in yet, but would like to? Ooh, Southern Florida. Southern so, Florida. yeah. So I have family down in West Palm Beach. I've spent a lot of time down in West, but the greater West Palm Beach area. I would, I lived down there a couple winters ago and that's, a, that's an area that I would love to, um, have some investment property and in. both, you know, selfishly that I can enjoy, but also I, I think that's out, that Southern Florida market is, um, is really strong. Awesome. Name one tech tool or app that's absolutely indispensable for your daily real estate operations. Okay. Interesting. Um, our app folio, so as boring as this is, app folio is our property management software. It saves our bacon, right? If I need to know anything about anything about the business, it's there, right? So it is technically, it's indispensable. The other thing is social media, right? And I try not to spend a lot of time on it consuming, but man, if you want to get your message out, you know, again, whether it's about the, a podcast like this or whether it's a meetup or share knowledge or ask for referrals and questions. Social media is, uh, it's a tool that's free and available to all of us. And if used wisely, 
can be very, very beneficial to a business owner. If used unwisely, it can be a huge waste of time. So two-sided <laughs> coin there. Du yeah, du double and double-sided coin there. And last question. Yeah. Should peanut butter be allowed on a tuna sandwich? I'm going to have to go hard no on that. <laughs> and I love both. I love both. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm open to explore things, but no, I don't think that should be allowed. Trevor, that was fun, man. All right. Well, well thank you, Todd. Tell, tell the audience how we can get a hold of you. If, if someone catches our podcast, if they want to like get to your meetups or invest with you guys, how do they get a hold of you? What, what yeah. So you? our meetup, Simplified Real Estate Investment Meetups on Facebook. We have a group with a bunch of people that hop in there, ask each other questions. We post our schedule there candorrealty.com and you can kind of find our different divisions and our team um on the website so yeah no and then we obviously have our our social media instagram and facebook you can find just search, type my name in and you will find me got it all right well todd thank you so again for your time man i really did enjoy the conversation you know, a lot to say i love the strategies you guys employ they're very very creative and uh your time is value so i will let you go and call it a wrap anything else you'd like to say before we uh it, no, I, I just really, I appreciate your time, Trevor. I, I appreciate everything you guys are doing, trying to, you know, help other investors. It's really near and dear to our heart as well. And so, you know, thanks for asking me to come on and allowing me to share a little bit of slice of knowledge. You're welcome. Your time. We appreciate your time. And uh, with that, that's all folks.